Welcome back to the First Gnostic Church of Christ, and we are now beginning a new book. This is actually the fifth tractate of the first codex. The fifth is titled the Tripartite Tractate. It is named that because it delves into the three different states of being a human. Now, this particular tractate is thought to have been written somewhere around the year 200 to 250, much like the previous book that we covered, the treatise on the resurrection, the author is unknown. There is some speculation that the author might have been Valentinus, or it might have been the school of Valentinus, or perhaps even the teacher of Valentinus, Heraculon. The tractate is an elaborate, untitled Valentinian theological treatise, which gives us an account of the devolution from and reintegration into the primordial Godhead. It's divided into primarily four segments, and each of the segments outlining different parts of the movement from the devolution to the reintegration, and then ultimately a discussion about returning back to the primordial source or the pleroma through the Christ. The first part is a description of the emanation of all supernatural entities from the primal source, starting with the Father and then going out from there. The second part of the tractate offers an interpretation of Genesis 1 through 5, which you know is the creation story. The first human being is produced in the one hand by the Demiurge, in the other hand by the Logos, so it breaks up the two different parts of the atom that was created, the psychic materials part and the spiritual component, so we'll discuss that. The third part focuses on the soteriological issues. The Savior's appearance divides humankind to those three groups that we talked about, and we'll discuss those three groups. And the final section, the text returns to the issue of the psychic and the process of salvation. It then proceeds to sketch an eschatological tableau, the last portions of which are quite fragmentary. So when you do see parentheses, it's an indication that it's not certain what those words were, and there will be several lines that will be missing from this text, and that will be pointed out as we read the text and provide commentary. Now with that backdrop, let's go ahead and begin. So as usual, I'm going to be reading from the Gnosis.org translation by Harold W. Atridge and Dieter Muller. Part 1. Introduction. As for what we can say about the things which are exalted, what is fitting is that we begin with a Father, who is the root of the totality, the one from whom we have received grace to speak about. So, of course, this is just introducing to us that this section, part one, is going to be about God and the beginning. Number two, the Father. He existed before anything other than himself came into being. Father is a single one, like a number, for he is the first one and the one who is only himself. Yet he is not like a solitary individual. Otherwise, how could he be a father? Now, this is where the writer is going to break away from some concepts of the way perhaps some Gnostics understand God. Some Gnostics will present to you what's called the monad. That was the beginning, meaning God was totally by himself and there was nothing else but God from the beginning. There are others that believe God was in fact a Godhead made up of a trinity such as you get from the Catholic Church, so forth and so on. And there's disagreements among the Protestant as to whether or not God is a God, and then below that is the Holy Spirit and the Son, or in fact God is a Godhead made up of those three parts. This writer believes that God is a trinity, a triad. So this is what he's presenting here. For whenever there is a father, the name son follows. But the single one, who alone is the father, is like a root, with tree, branches, and fruit. So already he's bringing forth the concept of three, tree, branch, and fruit. And also he is suggesting that since we call God the Father, would it not make sense that he in fact perhaps has a son? And you have to remember that, again, this is during the time in which women were not considered within the context of being holy figures. And of course, it's only quote-unquote natural that they would write that if the Father did, in fact, or God, have any type of conceptual offspring, not an actual physical offspring, but a conceptual one, then it would be, of course, a son and not a daughter. It is said of him that he is a father in the proper sense, 
since he is inimitable and immutable. Because of this, he is a single in the proper sense and is a God because no one is a God for him, nor is anyone a father to him. For he is unbegotten, and there is no other who begot him, nor another who created him. For whoever is someone's father or his creator, he too has a father and creator. It is certainly possible for him to be father and creator of the one who came into being from him and the one whom he created. For he is not a father in the proper sense, nor a God, because he has someone who begot him and who created him. It is then only the Father and God in the proper sense that no one else begot. As for the totalities, he is the one who begot them and created them. He is without beginning and without end. So far it doesn't say that God is made up of three parts, but he did suggest it by bringing forth the idea of the tree, branch, and fruit. And he also suggested it through bringing up the idea of the Son. Else why is he called a father? So let's continue. Not only is he without end, he is immortal for this reason, that he is unbegotten, but he is also invariable in his eternal existence, in his identity, in that by which he is established, in that by which he is great. Neither will he remove himself from that by which he is, nor will anyone else force him to produce an end which he has not ever desired. So again, this is suggesting predestination, that whatever God sets forth will come about exactly as God set forth, and there won't be any deviation from that ultimately. He has not had anyone who initiated his own existence. Thus he is himself unchanged, and no one else can remove him from his existence and his identity, that in which he is and his greatness, so that he cannot be grasped, nor is it possible for anyone else to change him into a different form, or to reduce him or to alter him or diminish him. Since this is so in the fullest sense of the truth, who is the unalterable, immutable one with immutability clothing him? This writer, of course, is presenting the material to a reader that maybe doesn't have an understanding of the concept of God. For the rest of us, who, of course, have been brought up to believe God is eternal from the past, almighty and um, omnipresent, so forth and so on, then this isn't uh, anything new. So we're just reading material that is very familiar to us. Not only is he the one called without a beginning, without an end, because he is unbegotten and mortal, but just as he has no beginning and no end, as he is, he is unattainable in his greatness, inscrutable in his wisdom, incomprehensible in his power, and unfathomable in his sweetness. In the proper sense, he alone, the good, unbegotten Father, and the complete perfect one, is the one filled with all his offspring and with every virtue, and with everything of value, and he has more, that is, lack of any malice, in order that it may be discovered that whoever has anything is indebted to him, because he gives it, being himself unreachable and unwearied by that which he gives, since he is wealthy in the gifts which he bestows, and at rest in the favors which he grants. This is, of course, a different impression of God than we might get from the Old Testament. God can be filled with malice, can get angry, can twist tongues to lie, can be jealous and envious and be angry and wrathful and be moved by what puny little humans do on earth. The impression we get from this understanding of God is God is forever giving and bestowing gifts to his creation, has no malice, has a pure heart, pure intent, and is perfect in every way, not only in creation, but in intention, to have ultimate outcome be exactly as intended. He is of such a kind and form and great magnitude that no one else has been with him from the beginning, nor is there a place in which he is, or from which he has come forth, or into which he will go, nor is there a primordial form which he uses as a model as he works, nor is there any difficulty which accompanies him in what he does, nor is there any material which is at his disposal, from which he creates what he creates, nor any substance within him from which he begets what he begets, nor a co-worker with him working with him on the things at which he works. To say anything of the sort is ignorant. Rather, one should speak of him as good, faultless, perfect, complete, being himself the totality. So you can see from this inscription of God, God is not a corporal being. It's a spiritual being, and he isn't using any materials by which God creates something. Totally self-sufficient, independent of anything. Not one of the names which are conceived or spoken, seen or grasped, not one of them applies to him. 
even though they are exceedingly glorious, magnifying, and honored. However, it is possible to utter these names for his glory and honor, in accordance with the capacity of each of those who give him glory. Yet, as for him, in his own existence, being, and form, it is impossible for mind to conceive him, nor can any speech convey him, nor can any eye see him, nor can any body grasp him, because of his inscrutable greatness, and his incomprehensible depth, and his immeasurable height, and his illimitable will. This is the nature of the unbegotten one, which does not touch anything else, nor is it joined to anything in the manner of something which is limited. Rather, he possesses in his constitution, without having a face or a form, things which are understood through perception. Hence also comes the epithet, quote, the incomprehensible. If he is incomprehensible, then it follows that he is unknowable, that he is the one who is inconceivable by any thought, invisible by anything, ineffable by any word, untouchable by any hand he alone is the one who knows himself as he is along with his form and his greatness and his magnitude and since he has the ability to conceive of himself to see himself to name himself to comprehend himself he alone is the one who is his own mind his own eye his own mouth his own form and he is what he thinks what he sees what he speaks what he grasps himself the one who is inconceivable ineffable incomprehensible immutable while sustaining, joyous, true, delightful, and restful is that which he conceives. Notice how completely different this is than the type of impression you get from the God of the Old Testament. He is self-sustaining, joyful, true, delightful, and restful. So that is someone that's unaffected, always pleasant, always at peace, is not angry, is not revengeful, is not judgmental and wrathful. That which he sees, that about which he speaks, that which he has as thought. He transcends all wisdom, and is above all intellect, and is above all glory, and is above all beauty, and all sweetness, and all greatness. So, in other words, God is not gracious because God is somehow a God that looks pitifully on humans. But it's in God's very nature to be utterly omnipotent and omnipresent, being able to see all things from the past and into the eternal future. How could he be moved in any way by what small little humans do on earth or become emotive or reactive? That wouldn't be possible, you see, if God were not eternal and all-seeing. This is what being suggested here. He transcends all wisdom and he's above all intellect and is above all glory, and is above all beauty, and all sweetness, and all greatness, and any depth, and any height. If this one, who is unknowable in his nature, to whom pertain all the greatnesses which I already mentioned, if out of the abundance of his sweetness he wishes to grant knowledge, so that he might be known his ability to do so. He has his power, which is his will. Now, however, in silence he himself holds back, he who is the Great One, who is the cause of bringing the totalities into their eternal being. Now, why is this writer going on and on, three or four paragraphs with all these colorful adjectives? Is he trying to brown-nose God? What's the purpose of this? The point is to make it very abundantly clear to the reader how above everything God is, and that God is not reactive or affected by humans, so that you can get a groundwork, you can get a foundational understanding of God as being above judgment, above wrathfulness, above anger, above all of these reactive qualities that are human qualities, not godlike qualities. So that we can already see how different this is and diametrically opposed to and different from the opposite end of what you get from the Old Testament God. And it continues, It is in the proper sense that he begets himself as ineffable, since he alone is self-begotten, since he conceives himself and since he knows himself as he is, what is worthy of his admiration and glory and honor and praise he produces because of the boundlessness of his greatness. In other words, when he talks about what is worthy of his admiration and glory and honor and praise, what it's essentially saying is God does not need that from you, doesn't need your praise, your admiration, and your glory. There's no need for you to do that. You're not worthy to do that, not meaning that you're worthless, but there's nothing you can do that's going to somehow bloviate God's ego and make him more favorably look on you or less favorably look on you. He produces because of the boundlessness of his greatness and the unsearchability of his wisdom and the immeasurability of his power and his untastable sweetness. 
He is the one who projects himself thus as generation, having glory and honor, marvelous and lovely, the one who glorifies himself who marvels. So you see, he is already glorifiable within the very essence of being, glorifying himself, just the fact of that greatness already speaks for itself, in other words. Who honors, who also loves, the one who has a son, who subsists in him, who is silent concerning him, who is the ineffable one in the ineffable one, the invisible one, the incomprehensible one, the inconceivable one in the inconceivable one. Now here is where it starts to suggest that perhaps this idea of a son was always with God from the beginning. Thus, he exists in him forever. The father, in the way we mentioned earlier, in an unbegotten way, is the one whom he knows himself, who begot him, as referring to Christ, having a thought, which is the thought of him, that is, the perception of him, again Christ, which is the, and we don't know what the word here is, of his constitution forever. That is, however, in the proper sense, the silence and the wisdom and the grace, if it is designated properly in this way. Now, I can understand why this writer might presuppose that the Son came from God from the beginning, or was with God always, as it says, constitution forever, from the past to now, as the Christ came in perfection as well, representing the Father in name here on earth. So one has to ask, how was he able to be perfect from the beginning? So one might therefore deduce that if in fact Christ is so perfect, then he had to come from the Father. The message really here is that God has everything in mind from the beginning, whatever he produces from the beginning. And as the whether or not that beginning Christ is the eternal forever in the past, or the beginning at the time at which he conceived the concept of the Son as being part of the story of humankind, doesn't really matter because for us humans, from our perspective, it's the beginning of everything anyway. And that's really all we need to know and we'll probably likely ever know anyway. Number three, the Son and the Church. Now this is where he introduces the two parts, the other two parts of, of God, the Son and the Church. And the Church later would sometimes be interchanged with the Holy Spirit and others would say the Church is in fact the fourth part. But again, these are all things that different sects will disagree on. Just as the Father exists in the proper sense, the one before him there was no one else, and the one apart from whom there is no other unbegotten one, so too the Son exists in the proper sense, the one before whom there was no other, and after whom no other Son exists. Therefore, he is a firstborn and an only Son, firstborn because no one exists before him, and only son because no one is after him. Furthermore, he has his fruit, that which is unknowable, because of its surpassing greatness. Yet he wanted it to be known because of the riches of his sweetness, and he revealed the unexplainable power, and he combined it with the great abundance of his generosity. This writer is suggesting that the son was the firstborn, and it goes on even to say, and there's no one else after him. Ultimately, here, what is important is to know that Christ is a unique being and the cosmic story of humankind. He's the centerpiece, if you will. And uh, within Gnostic Christianity, of course, Christ is the central figure, much like a will. He's the center part of a will, and then you have all these spokes going out. And he's what keeps the whole thing going uh, in motion. All right, not only did the Son, as it goes on to say, exist from the beginning, but the church, too, existed from the beginning. And here's what, what I was talking about. We start to introduce these ideas that everybody was with God from the beginning. And what does he mean by beginning, you see? Um, some can argue that he means beginning as in God forever in the eternal past. But if that's the case, there really is no beginning with God. Others might argue, well, beginning in the sense that when God conceived of creating the perfect sons and daughters of God, the human beings, whatever other beings he might have created in the universe, that was the beginning. And the Son was there from the beginning, and the church as well. And the church here is referring to married partner of Christ, that he marries the church. And the church is all the, all the people that make up the third type of person, which is the spiritual beings. So now, he who thinks of the discovery that the Son is only Son opposes the statement about the church because of the mysterious quality of the matter. It is not so. The writer is saying here that the Son is the only Son, and that shouldn't be a discovery to you. For just as the Father is a unity and has revealed himself as Father for him alone, so too the Son was found to be a brother to himself alone, in virtue of the fact that he is unbegotten without beginning. Everybody can be a son and daughter of God, and even Christ talked about, have I not told you that ye are all gods? And throughout the iconical texts and within Gnosticism, it continually talks about 
everyone being able to, or have been been from the beginning, sons and daughters of God. But this writer is trying to somehow bring forth the specialness of Christ, I think. And whether or not you agree or disagree, the uh, in, in the way he, in which this writer's doing it, I think it's more important of what I believe the writer's trying to convey to us, that Christ holds a unique place within the story, and I think we all can agree with that at least. All right, goes on to say, He wonders at himself along with the Father, and he gives himself glory and honor and love. Furthermore, he too is the one whom he conceives of as son, in accordance with the dispositions, without beginning and without end. Thus is the matter something which is fixed. Being innumerable and illimitable, his offspring are indivisible. Those which exist have come forth from the Son and the Father like kisses, because of the multitude of some who kiss one another with a good, insatiable thought, the kiss being a unity, although it involves many kisses. This is to say, it is the church consisting of many men that existed before the aeons, which is called, in the proper sense, quote, the aeons of the aeons, unquote. This is the nature of the holy, impressionable spirits upon which the Son rests, since it is His essence, just as the Father rests upon the Son. So he really is trying to bring forth the elevation of not only God, but those that follow God, to the point at which he's bringing Christ and the followers of Christ all the way back to the very beginning, whatever that means, whether it's the beginning of creation or it means beginning meaning whenever God was, which we all would probably presume would be forever in the past. But more importantly, he points out that Christ and the church existed even before the aeons. Number four, aeonic emanations. And we don't know where this starts, but we'll just start where it says dot dot dot. The church exists in the dispositions and properties in which the Father and the Son exists, as I have said from the start. Therefore, it subsets in the procreations of innumerable aeons. Christ, the Father, and the Church are all a Godhead that goes about creating everything else. And that's an interesting concept. Perhaps there's a reason we are called sons and daughters of God. Also, in an uncountable way, they too beget by the properties and the dispositions in which it, the Church, exists. So then the Church is able to beget uh, the, its people, whatever the followers of God are. For these comprise its association, which they form toward one another and toward those who have come forth from them toward the Son, for whose glory they exist. Now, this is another impression that you get from proto-Orthodox, the idea that God is a worshipable figure or Christ should be glorified in some way. Typically with Gnosticism, we don't look at God as someone that needs to be worshipped. Even Christ said, uh, you know, don't worship me. You know, some of this is implied as you read through this. It's a little different from what we typically get from most of the other books are being presented within the Nag Hammadi. So you can see how these different influences impacting each other. The proto-Orthodox under Peter and, and the more Gnostic approach of Paul and then the early uh, church fathers, you know, Valentinus and Irenaeus, and how these all kind of clash with these different followers within those different sects. Therefore, it is not possible for mind to conceive of him. He was the perfection of that place, nor can speech express them, for they are ineffable and unnameable and inconceivable. They alone have the ability to name themselves and to conceive of themselves, elevating the followers of God along almost at the level of Christ and the Father. For they have not been rooted in these places. Those of that place are ineffable and innumerable in the system which is both the manner and the size, the joy, the gladness of the unbegotten, nameless, unnameable, inconceivable, invisible, and comprehensible one, it is the fullness of the paternity, so that his abundance is a begetting of the aeons. Again, it's just reiterating that from this writer's perspective, the aeons followed after the church, the Christ, and God. They were forever in thought, for the Father was like a thought and a place for them. So it's almost like he's suggesting that the aeons were merely there to um, be part of carrying out the prime purpose, which was to create humans, and then everything else kind of served that, in, you know, indirectly or directly. They were forever in thought, for the Father was like a thought and a place for them. When their generations had been established, the one who is completely in control wished to lay hold of and to bring forth that which was deficient in the whatever, and he brought forth those in blank him. When their generations had been established, the one who is completely in control wished to lay hold of, but since he is as he is, he is a spring which is not diminished by the water which abundantly flows from him. While they were in the Father's thought, that is, in the hidden depth, 
The depth knew them, but they were unable to know the depth in which they were, nor was it possible for them to know themselves, nor for them to know anything else. That is, they were with the Father, they did not exist for themselves. Rather, they only had existence in the manner of a seed, so that it has been discovered that they existed like a fetus. It's good this writer's clarifying what he means, that he's saying the church and Christ were more seeds of thought. You can think of it that way, not so much entities. If that's the case, then I can say that's a little more agreeable to the way I think Gnostic Christians might, might think of a place that you'd put this in, in the whole puzzle. Like the word he begot them, subsisting spermatically, and the ones whom he was to beget had not yet come into being from him. The one who first thought of them, the Father, not only so that they might exist for him, but also that they might exist for themselves as well, that they might then exist in his thought as mental substance, and that they might exist for themselves too, so to thought like a spermatic seed. Now in order that they might know what exists for them, he graciously granted the initial form, while in order that they might recognize who is the Father who exists for them, gave them the name Father, by means of a voice proclaiming to them that what exists, exists through that name, which they have by virtue of the fact that they came into being, because the exaltation which has escaped their notice is in the name. All right, so the concept of the idea of a father. We all have a father, whether we adopt it, we know that father or not, or we were um, in a family where we're not adopted. The idea, the concept of the father is there. And that experience allows us to know God, the Father in heaven. So again, it's the same concept that Christ came to represent uh, the Father uh, in name. And so to all the fathers here that we have on this earth are representing in name, the concept of the Father. So ultimately, these are archetypes. Here's the Father, so put in a name. Here's God, put in a name. In this case, it would be Christ. The infant, while in the form of the fetus, has enough for him itself before ever seeing the one who sowed it. Therefore, they had the sole task of searching for him, realizing that he exists, ever wishing to find out what exists. Since, however, the perfect Father is good, just as he did not hear them at all so that they would exist only in his thought, but rather granted that they too might come into being. So ultimately he's bringing out the idea of uh, individuality, that the Father would, would remain silent so they have a space to find themselves and not be completely and utterly objectifying the Father themselves. So they're able to have full emptiness to come about and have a pure experience of finding their identity, what's being said here. So the Father is remaining silent for them to have the experience. And that's what we're having here in this realm, so that, you know, why people are having a difficult time believing there's a God, because God's remaining silent. That's what this writer's suggesting here. Existed from the beginning, this whole process, purposely. So also will he give them grace to know what exists, that is, the one who knows himself eternally. So the way in which we can achieve this is by having an imperfect experience in the kanoma, or the imperfect ram, a relationship to the Father, in a physical sense. A So there's a spiritual impression, and you could think of it as, the different forms of early Greek mythology of the, um, I think it's Plato, the perfect form, and then you have the form, which is not so perfect. And the way we come to know the perfect form is by first understanding the imperfect form, and also the potential to understand that perhaps there's something greater than, than the imperfect form, else how can we know that it's imperfect? And this is essentially what this writer is kind of also presenting, that we're having this imperfect experience so that we can know the true Father and its perfection here in this realm. So also will he give them grace to know what exists, that is, the one who knows himself eternally. And this is how we are able to experience the idea of love and grace, is that despite our imperfection, the perfect one still embraces us. And this is where this becomes instinctual for us to just to understand that process. Despite our imperfections, we're still taken in. And that's where the... the um, experience of grace happens and compassion is, is presented to us. Formed to know what exists, just as people are begotten in this place. When they are born, they are in, in the light, so that they see those who have begotten them. The Father brought forth everything, like a little child, like a drop from a spring, like a blossom from a vine, like a flower, like a planting, in need of gaining nourishment and growth and faultlessness. He withheld it for a time. He who had thought of it from the very beginning, possessed it from the very beginning, and saw it, but he closed it off to those who first came from him. He did this, not out of envy, but in order that the aeons might not receive their faultlessness 
from the very beginning and might not exalt themselves to the glory to the father and might think that from themselves alone they have this this is a, the other purpose that humans are experiencing the imperfection and that god is remaining silent distant from humans experience uh, as a way to hide us from i guess the aeons uh, else the aeons would believe that they are the only perfect ones and they might gloat and become prideful so forth and so on it's kind of what i'm getting from this and they might feel they have some way to have uh, authority over, or perhaps maybe envy or jealousy could come about. But just as he wished to grant that they might come into being, so too, in order that they might come into being as faultless ones, when he wished, he gave them the perfect idea of beneficence toward them. So that's how we are able to achieve the concept of ascension. That's what brings about the idea of how it says, how can the lowly being be um, risen above the angel, so to speak? And the angels, some of the angels became envious that this lowly uh, human was able to go from this lowly position and their ultimate destiny was to rise above the angels. How could that be? You know, um, that this is what he says here. He gave them the perfect idea of beneficence toward them. So not only did he create the sons and daughters of God, he created the aeons as well. But in addition, the sons and daughters of God received grace, whereas the aeons did not have need for grace. And this is the whole prodigal story, where the aeons are always with the Father in heaven. And then you have the lowly humans that Orthodox Christians call a fall, but in this writer calls a beneficence, a grace that's being experienced. And this is the, the prodigal son story, where they go out and they party and they do all this, and eventually they, they come back to the pleroma, but all the while, uh, when they return to the Pleroma, the God in heaven throws a big party. And then, of course, the son that always was with the father gets jealous and says, well, I've been with you all this time. Why are you not throwing a big party for me? And, of course, um, God says to the son, everything that I'm giving to um, this returned son has always been at your disposal. You've always had that. Why do you envy? It was a blueprint and was a setup for perhaps Sophia. And we'll get to that story in um, particularly the origin story and some of the other books, but I do think it's it. Uh, you can see some of that in this paragraph. We'll just read one more paragraph and and then we'll pick up in the next video. The one whom he raised up as a light for those who came from himself, the one from whom they take their name. He is the Son who is full, complete, and faultless. He brought him forth mingled with what came forth from him, partaking of the totality in accordance by which each one can receive him for himself, though such was not his greatness before he was received by it. Rather, he exists by himself. As for the parts in which he exists in his own manner and form and greatness, it is possible for them to see him and speak about that which they know of him, since they wear him while he wears them, because it is possible for them to comprehend him. And it's just referring to the followers of God and how they can be a testament about God, because it's within them. He, however, is as he is, incomparable. So everything that we're going to say about God is always going to be imperfect, basically. In order that the Father might receive honor from each one and reveal himself, even in his ineffability, hidden and invisible, they marvel at him mentally. Therefore, the greatness of his loftiness consists in the fact that they speak about him and see him. It becomes manifest so that he may be hymned because of the abundance of his sweetness with the grace of, and we don't know what this word is, and just as the admirations of the silences are eternal generations and they are mental offspring, so too the dispositions of the word are spiritual emanations. Both of them, admirations and dispositions, since they belong to a word, are seeds and thoughts of his offspring and roots which live forever, appearing to be offspring which have come forth from themselves being minds and spiritual offspring to the glory of the Father. All right, this is very clearly Gnostic in um, description because this is showing how we really are extensions of the Father, emanation. Um, we aren't some separate creation that's foreign and distant, cold from the Father, and, and God the Father is you know up in heaven like an attorney with a gavel, judgmental eyes looking down on us with wrath and hatred, looking at us as wretched beasts. In fact, we are worthy because we are part of God. We're an extension of God. And this is what is being said here. And we are testament of God as we walk earth among those that are not of a spiritual nature. Our very nature speaks God or emanates God or shines forth God, even in silence. 
a present is always a testament, is what's being suggested here. There is no need for voice and spirit, mind and word, because there is no need to work at that which they desire to do, but on the pattern by which he was existing. So are those who have come forth from him, begetting everything which they desire. So here again, it's just going back to there's no need for laws. There's no need for you to try to make efforts toward trying to get into heaven or to find your worthiness. The worthiness has already been given to you from the beginning. You were created that way. You are, it's already in your mind. It's already it's spoken word, as God said, and th therefore it was. It's just the way it is. And the only thing you need to do is make a decision on when you want to detach. And it's a process, of course. You can't just say you want to detach. It's not a matter of what you want. It really is a matter of the consequence of who you are and what you will become. And goes on, And the one whom they conceived of and whom they speak about, and the one toward whom they move, and the one whom they are, and the one they him, thereby glorifying him, he has sons. For this is procreative power, like those from whom they have come, according to their mutual assistance, since they assist one another like the unbegotten ones. And this is just saying, as I said before, that those that put faith and stock in the understanding of the kanoma and the Gnostic moment, Gnosis, realization of the true Father and the Pleroma and our true home, we are a walking testament onto all other human beings. And anyone that's somewhat spiritual can recognize that, particularly those in the middle that might be threatened or spiritual, other spiritual beings that do not, you know, they don't see this as their best interest. They'd rather want to hoard or lord of other beings or people. Uh, of course, they're going to f find that to be threatening. The Father, in accordance with his exalted position over the totalities, being an unknown, incomprehensible one, has such greatness and magnitude that if he had revealed himself suddenly, quickly, to all the exalted ones among the aeons who had come forth from him, they would have perished. That makes sense because, again, he's in, inexhaustible, he's eternal. You know, it just would be incomprehensible. And it's not something I believe the mind could manage or handle. Therefore, he withheld his power and his inexhaustibility within that which he is. He is ineffable and unnameable and exalted above every mind and every word. So this is something that sort of has to be experienced through time and through experience and wisdom, growing, ascending. And the more we're able to grow and ascend, the larger we become and the more that we can take in. This one, however, stretched himself out, and it was that which he stretched out, which gave a foundation and space and a dwelling place for the universe in name of his being, the one through whom, since he is father of the all, out of his laboring for those who exist, having sown into their thought that they might seek after him. This just repeating what I just said, you know, that he stretched it through time and through experience through the universe and it's expanding you see um so this concept of the big bang you know it's from that inception of the small singular spot and expanding out to all infinity this is an experience unfolding so that it can be properly handled otherwise it would be beyond our grasp and we would instantly probably be extinguished from the awesomeness of it and that it's also within us to go out into that pioneering uh, experience because the universe is ever expanding so it's already setting in us to go out into the unknown it's just within us as humans to have that because it is the essence of the universe the abundance of their consists in the fact that they understand that he exists and the fact that they ask what it is that was existing this one was given to them for enjoyment and nourishment and joy and abundance of illumination so you see here the silence the silence is what is forever captivating and is forever causing us to go out and expand and grow if we know there's nothing to grow you see if we know everything so the unknowing the unknowable one has allowed for that unknowable space to be filled with wisdom and experience an abundance of nourishment and enjoyment and illumination, which consists in his fellow laboring, his knowledge and his mingling with them, that is, the one who is called and is, in fact, the Son, since he is the totalities and the one whom they know both, who he is, and that it is he who clothes. And here is just suggesting that Christ came in the name of the Father to reawaken us, because through time we had lost that. And of course the Demiurge again wants to keep us here. And so we lost that when we were in the dark, and it caused great suffering. And so the sun came to bring back that Gnostic moment to help us understand, remember, reacquaint ourselves so that we can understand 
that there is no need to cry or to be in sorrow or suffering or terror or, terror or fear has been defeated by the Christ. And this is not the end for you, you see. It's just the beginning. This is the one who's called Son and the one whom they understand that he exists and they were seeking after him. This is what everybody's seeking after. Even the scientists, everyone's seeking this. Most, no one knows it, that ultimately when it's all said and done, that's what they will find at the end of it. This is the one who exists as Father and is the one about whom they cannot speak and the one of whom they do not conceive. This is what the scientists always baffle. Well, if there is a God, why doesn't it show up? Why don't they, you know, like, why isn't there proof? Well, this is purposely set out that there is not proof of God, not in the um, scientific sense or the experimental sense or the steps of science sense of the word or philosophical ways of going about God, trying to find God. This is the one who first came into being. It is impossible for anyone to conceive of him or think of him. Or can anyone approach there toward the exalted one, toward the pre-existent in the proper sense? But all the names conceived or spoken about him are presented in honor as a trace of him, according to the ability of each one of those who glorify him. So in other words, there are people walking among us that are always testament testimony of, of God's existence. And all of existence is constantly telling us that life itself is representing God. God's very existence is everywhere. Now, he arose from him when he stretched himself out from begetting for knowledge on the part of the totalities, he and all the names without falsification, and he is, in the proper sense, the sole first one, the man of the Father, that is, the one whom I call. The form of the formless, the body of the bodiless, the face of the invisible, the word of the unutterable, the mind of the inconceivable, the fountain which flowed from him, the root of those who are planted, and the God of those who exist, the light of those whom he illumines, the love of those whom he loves, the providence of those for whom he providentially cares, the wisdom of those whom he made wise, the power of those to whom he gives power, the assembly of those whom he assembles to him, the revelation of the things which are sought after, the eye of those who see, the breath of those who breathe, the life of those who live, the unity of those who are mixed with the totalities. All of them exist in the single one, as he clothes himself completely, and by a single name he is never called. This is how everything exists in the nothing. That's the astounding paradox of the very existence that's being talked about here. It would make it seem like everything is almost duplicating itself, but in fact it's talking about the paradox, the wisdom of those who may, he made wise. But at the end it says, the unity of those who are mixed with the totalities, all of them exist in the single one. As he clothes himself completely and by a single name, he is never called. That's the invisible that is, in essence, holding all of eternity. That's the paradox. And in this unique way, they are equally the single one and the totalities. What is single is the infinite emptiness, the infinite nothing. That's the single, what they call the unifying moment, the singularity. When they find the singularity, should science ever find singularity, what they will find is absolute nothingness. And that's the totality of everything. That's the paradox. He is neither divided as a body, nor is he separated into the names which he has received, so that he is one thing in this way, and another in another way. All things, right, left, up, down, you name it. The paradoxes, the opposites. The very essence of the universe works on a paradox, and that's why it's always going to confound the scientists. They're never going to get it, because they don't understand that at the very core of existence is a paradox. Also, neither does he change in, nor does he turn into the names which he thinks of, and become now this, now something else. This thing now being one thing, and at another something else. Rather, he is holy himself to the uttermost. He is each and every one of the totalities forever at the same time. He is what all of them are. So think about this was written thousands of years ago, and yet it's talking about quantum physics. It's talking about the singularity. It's talking about the paradox of being many things and many the multiplicities of many universes. He brought the Father to the totalities. He also is the totalities, for he is the one who is knowledgeable for himself, and he is each one of the properties. He has the powers, and he is beyond all that which he knows, while seeing himself in himself completely and having a son in form. Therefore, his powers and properties are innumerable and inaudible because of the begetting by which he begets them. Innumerable and indivisible are the begettings of his words and his commands and his totalities. He knows them, which things he himself is, since they are in the single name and are all speaking in it. 
and he brings them forth, in order that it might be discovered that they exist according to their individual properties in a unified way. And he did not reveal the multitude to the totalities at once, nor did he reveal his equality to those who had come forth from him. And again, we already talked about why God purposely did this, so that we may find our individuality in our, within that unifying field of experience. This is, uh, again, talking about you know this unified theory, so forth and so on. Uh, but the scientists don't really un know why they have these concepts and ideas come in their mind, but they do. They're inspired. They're inspired because it is the essence of truth within the universe. And it's been sp spoke about here 2,000 years ago. So that experience is what you need to know. And that, you know, whether or not, you know, these material experiences, what is, makes uh, the scientists at all is not the fact that stars glowing and it's beautiful, but the great mystery um, that's being presented here in these words. How can it be? You know, that's the, the amazing part of it. How is it that it is all one, but yet we're all individuals? How is it that it's all unified, but yet we are all paradoxically finding our individual selves? How is that all possible? And how is it that there is a creation, but then there's no answer as to why? But yet what grapples the scientists is they can never give up wanting to expand into ever further reaches of questioning and wanting to know why. Wanting to know, wanting to know, and they don't know what drives them and where they get these concepts from, how they get inspired. All right, that's it for now. And when we pick up in the next video, we'll go to part five, and that's the aeonic life. And from this first part of the tripartite tractate. And uh, I know this video was a bit long, but I think it was important for us to get through that entire section so that we really can kind of see the flow of where this is trying to go. And I think it's a good place to stop because now that you have that foundation of the church, the son, and the father, we can now go on to the next level, at least according to this writer, Aeonic Life, section five of this part. All right, thanks for listening. We'll talk again soon. Bye-bye.